Hi, this is J.C. Hallman. This is the Anarcha Archive, and in our first bonus episode, it might be getting a little spooky. We're going to be looking at representations of J. Marion Sims, statues, drawings, and paintings, and eventually we'll come to something that just might scare you a little bit. In the decades after J. Marion Sims died in 1883, there were two paintings commissioned to solidify his place in the history of medicine. The first is very well known. It's one of 45 oil paintings by artist Robert Tom, who in the late 1950s was commissioned to create 45 oil paintings that told the history of medicine. It's a little difficult to see from the decades of remove, and just by itself the work is troubling, but it's not too hard to recognize how this painting was already beginning to comment on the Sims legacy. When it was created, the only story that Tom had to go on was Sims' own autobiography. Sims had claimed that his experimental subjects, about ten young enslaved women, including Anarka, Lucy, and Betsy, had acted with heroic resolve throughout begging him for additional procedures. In portraying the women in this painting as afraid, and they are clearly terrified, Tom was already beginning to question Sims' version of events. The painting is now held at the University of Michigan, but it has been removed from public view, and rightfully so. The second painting came a couple decades later, and the commission went to an artist named Marshall Boulden III, who was most famous for a painting of the daughters of Richard Nixon. The decision to include Anarka Westcott in an image honoring five famous Alabama surgeons was made at the last minute. Boulden's Medical Giants of Alabama was hung in a posh conference room at the Center for Advanced Medical Studies at the University of Alabama Birmingham, and it remained there until a Harvard professor, delivering a lecture on ethics in that very room, made a stink about the painting. It, too, has now been removed. Of course, a great number of paintings and images of Sims were created during his lifetime as well, and it's not hard to pick up on his vanity. Sims was very conscious of the optics of his life, and that's maybe best understood from an image that first appeared in Frank Leslie's illustrated newspaper. Early in his time in New York, Sims cultivated media contacts, and he befriended Frank Leslie, whose newspaper was sort of a periodical version of P.T. Barnum, think of something like The National Enquirer meets National Geographic. When Leslie arranged for a story to be written about Sims, Sims was sent to the eminent photographer Matthew Brady, who would come to be famous for his many Civil War photographs. Brady also created many memorable portraits of important Americans. Sims' vanity is revealed in his rejection of Brady's first picture of him. He went back for another, which was then adapted for the illustration of Sims in Frank Leslie's newspaper. Sims was more or less obsessed with receiving credit for innovations and surgeries. Here, very late in his life, Sims is writing publicly to ensure that he receives credit for a procedure that was already being debunked and which was responsible for the mutilation of thousands of women by Sims himself and by many doctors who imitated him. The antero-posterior incision belongs to Sims, he's referring to himself in the third person here, and not to Emmett or anyone else. Sims could be very tricky and duplicitous about this kind of thing as well. In 1874, he produced his best-known standalone article, The Discovery of Anesthesia. Ostensibly, Sims was weighing in on a then-heated debate about who should receive credit for the invention of anesthesia. Men named Colton, Morton, and Wells were the leading candidates, but Sims preferred a man named Crawford Long. This is Long. In 1842, having witnessed the effects of ether at parties, so-called ether frolics, Long conducted experiments on young enslaved men, amputating fingers and toes after they had been etherized. Early in his career in New York, Sims had become close with a man named Henry Stewart. There are no extant images of Stewart, but I did manage to find some of his letters. His handwriting is remarkable. For decades, Stewart acted as a kind of agent for Sims, helping him launch his New York career and defending him as controversies over Sims' work erupted. And, in fact, it was Henry Stewart, working for Sims, who commissioned this portrait of Crawford Long, which now hangs in the Georgia State Capitol, 
right next to the chambers of the Georgia Supreme Court. The painting is by artist F. B. Carpenter, who had previously published a book about spending six months at the White House to paint a portrait of Lincoln. But now take a closer look, because this painting is not just an image of Long. Off to the side, deep in the background, a face peeks out from the shadows. It's J. Marion Sims, finding a way to insert himself into a history and a legacy that he had nothing to do with. The image in the painting appears to be a rendering of a bust of Sims that is now held in the archives of Jefferson University in Philadelphia. It, too, has been removed from public view. It was hardly an accident that Sims was in the painting. When the work was finished, Henry Stewart delivered it to Georgia personally. His official letter, handing the painting over, takes pains to indicate that Sims, too, is a discoverer and claims that it is fitting that these two eminent Southern men should both be represented, as they are in Mr. Carpenter's picture. In New York City, a statue of Sims was first erected in Bryant Park in 1894. Several decades later, it was moved to an outer wall of Central Park, where it remained until 2018, when at last it was removed from public view. Some articles claim that the statue was reinstalled at his gravesite in Brooklyn's Greenwood Cemetery. But that's not true. And actually, the granite base of the monument is still in place in Central Park. It's been covered over, but the text heralding Sim's greatness is still there. And as of 2023, the city has not installed a work by sculptor Vinnie Bagwell that is supposed to replace Sim's statue. There are other Sim's monuments as well. This statue continues to stand in Montgomery, Alabama. It was erected by the Medical Association of the State of Alabama, which has since called for it to be removed. Another monument to Sims stands in Columbia, South Carolina. In both Alabama and South Carolina, recent and hastily passed laws prevent the removal of these monuments. That's wrong. And what it all adds up to is the fact that even though Sims' legacy has been completely upended, two and a half of the three public monuments that were erected to honor him after he died are still in place today. These monuments continue to demonstrate that unscrupulous behavior in doctors can still go unpunished. And the statues continue to stand as a warning to those who harbor all too valid fears that people like them may be subjected to medical experimentation without their consent. Sims' sneaky and desperate efforts to write himself into medical history with a false version of his own narrative is all the more reason that the remaining public monuments to his so-called greatness should be removed. Oh, oh, oh.